I mean, really, look at that cutter. There's no way this is going to work. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the MLA-18 die filer kit today, and it's a bit of a milestone in the project because we're going to finish up that big gnarly main casting, or baby elephant as one of my patrons called it. So uh, we're going to do some sketchy operations on this thing once again, and we're going to do a little bit of tool making to do a tricky operation. Should be fun. Let's go. The first order of business today are the ears on my baby elephant. These are where the table mounts, so we need to thread some holes in there. This is trickier than it sounds because, of course, you can see how those holes set the axis of the table once installed. We've got three constraints that we need to maintain. The two holes form an axis, and that axis needs to be square to the part in every direction, and those holes need to be centered on their respective bosses as best we can. I guess that's only two constraints. It felt like more. The first constraint is the less crucial of the two. I'm going to attempt to get both holes in the center of their respective bosses. Now, much like all the other bosses on this casting, these aren't particularly round, and we're not going to be able to get this perfect, but if we can get kind of close, then that'll be a nice thing. You're not really going to be able to see these when they're done because they're going to be covered by the table mounting brackets, but we'll at least give it our best shot here. I'm going to approximate the center as best I can here using my center finder tool. These bosses, as I said, are not round, and I also can't fit the tool super well all the way around here, but this will give us a pretty good indication here. And of course, the two bosses are not going to be the same. They're both cast features, and I know for a fact that one of them was crooked. Nevertheless, I found what I hope is a decent center there, and I will center punch that, and that'll be a good reference here in a minute when we set this thing up. And then I'm going to flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. And once again, those center marks are to mark the center of the bosses, not necessarily where the holes are going to go, because of course the axis formed by those two punch marks is almost certainly not the right one that we need to use. I'm going to do this operation on the lathe, contrary to what your intuition might be, because doing it on the lathe is going to give me a really powerful method to ensure that the axis of these two holes is right where I need it to be. I need to do it upside down again, much like the boring that we did previously. So I'll try some packing here, and two one two three blocks looks like it's going to be really close, so we'll start there. My fixturing is just going to be a single long threaded rod right through all of my packing and right through the center of the casting here. This is a very light duty operation that we're doing, just a little bit of drilling, so we don't need a real heavy duty fixture here. This will work just fine. Of course, I have to start by getting these bosses square to the lathe before I do anything else. So to do that, I have clamped a parallel to one of those bosses to extend the surface and give me a large surface to indicate on, which will increase the precision of my indicating here. That little boss is much too short to indicate with any amount of accuracy. So with that, I can run it back and forth and tappy tap tap this thing until it's running nice and straight. As I've said previously, the key to this technique is to preload the indicator as little as possible, because if you preload it too much, the spring pressure gets higher and it's going to cause that parallel to deflect. This step has ensured that the axis that we create with the two threaded holes is going to go through the casting square in both dimensions. Now I can put the center in my spindle and I can bring that in and I'm going to align this with the punch mark on this boss. So we know the axis will be square and now I'm going to do my best to get that axis to run through both punch marks so that they get centered on the bosses on both sides. In this case the two one two three blocks have gotten the height just about right on this side so that's good. On the other side, however, you can see that the punch mark is quite a bit too high there. Left to right, they're both fairly close, but that's trivial because we can just use the cross slide to set that. So I needed to lower the casting a little bit here, so I took out the one to three blocks and I replaced one of them with a stack of parallels that was a little bit thinner than one of the blocks to bring it down a little bit. And then I set the casting back on there, and of course now, before I check anything else, I need to square it up again because every time I touch this setup, it needs to be squared up once again, and as you'll see, I'm going to be doing this quite a bit, so I get pretty darn efficient at this whole squaring up process. Then I check it again between both centers, and again, what I'm trying to do is just split the difference vertically between the two punch marks. I want both holes to end up as close to the center of their respective bosses as possible, but they both have to be on this axis here that we've established that's square to the casting. I went back and forth a couple of times on that. You can see that I landed on a stack of thick and thin parallels there, and this looks really good. Then I split the difference horizontally just with setting the cross slide. The next step in my procedure then is to put my center drill in the spindle, and I'm going to center drill the boss on this side. 
And this lands close to my punch mark, but not right on it, because of course, again, we've compromised a little bit on both punch marks to get a single axis that runs as close to both of them as possible, but is square through the casting. With that one nice punch mark in there, now I can loosen the fixture and spin the casting around 180 degrees, and I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. I need to establish my center drills on both sides before I do anything else. You'll see why here in a moment. And now, of course, I have to square it up again before I do anything else, because, of course, I've touched the setup again. Once the casting is flipped around and squared up, we need to find the same axis that we used to create that first center drill now on the other side. Luckily, that's easy. On the height, we haven't changed that. It's the same packing. And then on the horizontal position, all I have to do is adjust the cross slide until the tailstock center slides nicely into that center drill that was created by the headstock. So you can see how I'm using the power of the two centers on the lathe to establish that axis through the casting. So now when I center drill on this side, once again, it's not exactly on my punch mark, but it's pretty close. I now have a center on both sides of the casting, and I can recreate that axis that we established anytime I need to. I needed to create these center drill references on both sides before we do anything else, because otherwise, when we flip the casting after this set of operations, I'm going to have a threaded hole on the other side and no way to find that original axis again. That's why the extra back and forth here was so crucial. I needed to get those references established on both sides. But now with those references, I can just leave the casting where it is, and I can drill the first of these with the tapping drill size. These are blind holes. They don't go all the way through, but it's easy to measure the depth with the carriage DRO, or you could put an indicator on the carriage. It's kind of fun to be doing operations like this on the lathe where you're sort of doing everything backwards including putting my spring-loaded tap follower in the spindle instead of the tailstock and tapping the other direction with the tap wrench here. I really enjoy doing these kinds of unusual lathe setups. It's a good reminder of how flexible and powerful the lathe really is and why for a good hundred years or so model engineers worked with only a lathe. Hobby milling machines are a relatively new invention. With that side complete, I can once again loosen the casting and spin it around 180 degrees for hopefully the last time. And then, of course, once again, I have to clamp the parallel on there and get this guy squared up. Setups like this require patience, but it's worth the time to do it right. Then once again, I find the center mark there with the center in the spindle, and that gets me back on the axis that we've established. And now I can drill and tap the second hole with confidence, knowing it will be aligned with the other one and on an axis that is square through the casting in both dimensions. As for the other constraint of getting the holes centered on their respective bosses, I think we did okay there. The bosses are distinctively egg-shaped, so there was only so much that we could do there anyway, but I think we did pretty well. Now on to this big counterbore in the back here. There's a cover plate that bolts on to the back here and encloses the mechanism in the oil bath inside. And the trick here is that we're going to be creating a shoulder that has a bolt circle on it. And that shoulder depends on this casting shoulder here. And as you can see, the core that formed that shoulder in this casting is quite a bit off center. That's going to create some fun for us here, but we're going to press on anyway and see how it goes. A quick check with the caliper here gives me a sense of how much material I'm going to have to remove. The answer is quite a bit. So for that reason, I'm going to be doing it on the lathe. A boring operation like this with a boring head in the mill would be extremely tedious, as opposed to doing it on the lathe where we have all the power feeding and such. Now this might look a little sketchy, and it is certainly an intimidating setup here, but as you can see here, the nose that I'm clamping on in the forejaw does not have any draft angle on the casting. So I feel good about this setup because I've got a really good grip here on all four jaws. Plus the nose there is faced square, so this should be a very sturdy setup. If your lathe can't spin up the big cast angle like this, another way to do it would be the reverse of this setup that I did for boring the nose. This would work just as well flipping the casting around 180 degrees and boring the back of it with the boring head, if your boring head is large enough. This at least gives you the advantage of the power feeding on the carriage, so it's still quite a bit faster than doing it on the milling machine, even though you still have to deal with constantly changing the cut depth on the boring head. I'm going to attempt to indicate this in as concentrically as I can now. It's a little bit tricky because it's, of course, a rough casting, and the casting, once again, is not very round here. But I've got a button indicator there with a lever arm on it that lets me sneak in behind the base there and measure the outside of the casting here as I dial it in. 
my goal is to get this counterbore feature centered on the outside of the casting. It's not going to line up with the core in the middle, and I don't mind that because, of course, that core is very crooked, so we wouldn't want to align with that. Nevertheless, I wasn't able to get it very concentric here. I had to settle for centering each axis on the four jaw separately. So the first jaw is at about 28 thou there, and then the opposite jaw there is at about 32, 33. And then the other axis is at about 8 thou, and then the opposite is at about 5 thou. So on each axis, the casting is centered within a couple of thousands. But there's no overall position where the entire casting is running concentric because it's just far too out of round to do that. So this is a pretty good compromise, I think. I'll be able to double check this later before we fully commit to this position. But now we have a massive problem. That is to say, a problem with mass. As is plainly obvious here, roughly half the mass of this casting is all in that giant base that's hanging out at the bottom there. So this mass is very, very unbalanced, and there'd be no way we could spin it up safely and smoothly as is. So we need some counterweight opposite that base. For this, I'm going to use an old model engineer's trick, and that is to use the change gears from your lathe as counterweights. These are a handy item that are heavy and have a hole through the middle of them for convenient bolting. And since we just made some nice threaded holes on either side of this casting, I can easily bolt some change gears in here to hopefully offset the mass of the base there. I put roughly an even amount on both sides and gave that a little test, and that's a lot better, but I can still tell it's pretty bottom heavy, but let's spin it up here and see what the lathe thinks. You can see the motor definitely feeling the offset mass there. So it's okay, but it's not great. I can only get about 150 RPM out of this before the lathe decides it wants to walk off the job. So we need more mass, but conveniently I've got yet another hole where I can easily bolt some stuff in. In this situation, I used a bolt with one of the threaded holes on a 123 block. I tightened that down, and I didn't think that was really going to be enough mass, so I took the last remaining change gear that I had, and I bolted that down to the 123 block using one of the other threaded holes on that block. And that is quite a bit of mass now. Let's see how this goes. Before I spin this up, I'm just double-checking that everything is tight here. And I checked it a couple of times after I started cutting as well. That feels pretty good. It's certainly not perfect, but it's reasonably stable here. This is a permanent magnet motor, so it's not going to completely freewheel. We can't really test for balance without powering it up and just seeing how much it shakes. You could also take the belt off the spindle to allow it to freewheel and test it that way, but that's not very easy to do on this lathe, so I just spin it up and let the lathe tell me what it thinks. And that's pretty good. I can get it up to about 350 RPM there before it starts shaking too badly. And I'm going to run it at about 300 or less anyway, so I think this will be just fine. It looks a little terrifying, but it's going to work. So in with the boring bar now. I've got a boring bar stuck out long enough such that the carriage will clear the spinning base and counterweights there. That's very important. That kind of thing is easy to forget. Now because of how offset that core is, we're going to have an interrupted cut here for a long time. So it was quite a few passes before I got into a continuous cut all the way around and sort of straightened out that core. Once I did get a complete cut all the way around, then I stopped here and did one more check on how well centered I am on the outer dimension of the casting there. This is just an aesthetic thing, but it is going to be a prominent feature on the machine when I'm done, so I want to get this nicely centered. And that's looking really good. My hole looks like it's going to end up well centered visually here, so away we go. We've got a lot more material to remove. Because we have so much material to remove, if this hole had not been well centered, we could have easily adjusted the position at this point to shift the hole a little bit one way or another. And this is going pretty well. I will say, though, that this setup was extremely prone to chatter. I think that's due to how much of this spinning mass is sticking out so far from the chuck. This casting is quite heavy, and all of the mass is quite far away from the chuck. So even though it's a heavy casting and I've got a really strong grip and it's not a difficult cut, still, it was extremely chatter prone. I had to take light cuts and take my time to keep chatter under control here. However, since I'm doing this on the lathe and the power feeding is easy and this isn't a very deep cut, uh, this was actually quite easy to do. This really didn't take very long even with the light cuts. This is certainly an exciting setup if nothing else. I should be close now, so I'll start taking some measurements. 
using a telescoping bore gauge for this, of course. Very close there, so one more finishing cut, and we should be in business. This doesn't have to be super accurate because you can always turn the cover plate to fit if you need to, but might as well hit the dimension if we can. After that finishing cut then, I went into the final depth on this counterbore and I faced the back of it there by feeding outwards from the center. I was stopping a couple thousandths short of final depth on each pass so that I could clean up that inner face there and get a nice surface finish in both places. And one final check here. I'm aiming for three and an eighth here. Survey says three, one twenty five and a half. Yeah, we'll take that. I double checked the depth here as well, just using the guessometers because of course the depth is relative to a rough casting and that cast face is not particularly square. So I just picked a depth that kind of averaged out all the way around to about where the drawing says it's supposed to be. And I'll deburr those edges. And that is looking really good. I'm pleased with how that turned out. Against all odds, I actually got good finishes on both those surfaces there. There's nothing more I can get out of this setup, so let's tear it all down and pull this thing off the lathe. I can get a really good look at that feature now and see how I did on the centering. And I'm actually really happy with that. That centered up really nicely. You have to look at the alignment relative to the outer edge of the casting only. It's a bit of an optical illusion there. It looks off-center because of the inner casting core, which is off-center. Speaking of that off-center core, now it's time to set up for the bolt pattern that goes inside there on that little shoulder. So for this, I've got the angle plate on my mill, and I'm going to get this guy squared up. And, well, squaring it up with the square would be sufficient, but then I put an indicator on it, and, well, then I had to tap it in, and, well, you know, sometimes fussiness spirals out of control for no good reason. Because the base and the nose of that casting there are both faced square to each other, this casting will sit down there nicely against that angle plate, no problem. And I can just clamp it to the angle plate. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But only with consent. I'll tappy tap tap that down a little bit just to make sure it's sitting square on that nose. And now we can get ready to do the bolt circle. For this, I centered up on the spindle with the coaxial indicator there on the counterbore that we just machined. And it was very easy because it's, of course, a perfectly machined circle that we just did on the lathe. I programmed the bolt pattern into the DRO and I did a little dry run, just running around with the center drill and making a little mark to make sure each hole was going to land in a reasonable place. My concern was that because of the off-center core, the shoulder gets a little thin on one side. And I wasn't sure if I was going to have enough meat there for the threaded holes. And the answer is no, I definitely do not. On one side here, the threaded hole is going to break through the edge of that shoulder. So this was not going to work. However, I think I can work around this by just enlarging the radius of the bolt pattern a little bit to make room here. So I put one of the bolts in the chuck and I tweaked the radius of the bolt circle until I found a distance that would center the bolt nicely on the thinnest part of the shoulder there. And then I checked what that radius actually was on the DRO and then I reprogrammed my bolt circle for that radius. The bolts are pretty small, so luckily I can get away with that. And then I was able to run around the bolt pattern on the DRO with the center drill first, and then with the tapping drill. And then, of course, running around a final time with the actual tap to tap all the holes. Now, because I've enlarged the radius a little bit here, it's possible that the counter bores on the cover plate that goes in here might no longer fit on that cover plate. But really, the worst that might happen here is that the counter bores might break through the edge of the cover plate, and that's not really a huge deal. It's just a slightly cosmetic issue. And if it's a big deal, I can actually turn down the bolts a little bit to make the cap heads smaller. That's a trick I've done in situations like this. But I've got it off the machine now, and I can do a little test by threading in one of the bolts. And you can see that there's just a whisper of material there, so I don't think the counter bores will break through on the cover plate. But again, if they do a little bit, it's not a huge deal. The next feature is a deceptively interesting one. We need spot faces around these bolt holes here. And that seems straightforward. Normally a spot face around a bolt hole you can just do with an end mill, takes five seconds. However, on this casting, the spot face is quite large, and in fact there isn't enough clearance down the side of the casting here for a tool that would be large enough to create that spot face. The spot face actually sticks down under the curvature of the casting there. So really what we're going to need here is a dedicated spot facing tool. So to that end, I've got some 1144 stress proof here and a piece of tool steel, which I didn't end up using, but we're going to make ourselves a spot facing tool. The secret sauce here is that the spot facing tool needs to run in that existing hole there for support for this tool because it's a very high tool pressure operation. 
To that end, I need to know exactly how big those holes are. Obviously, I know the drill that I used to make those holes, but drills tend to cut oversized. These weren't reamed. So using gauge pins, I'm determining the exact size. And as is typical, these are about a thousandth oversize. So I'll use that information to create a spot facing tool with a bearing on the end that's going to have a very close running fit in those drilled holes. So I turn down the end of my steel here on the lathe. It happens to already have a center in it, which is running quite true, and that's handy because I can just use that to drill and tap a hole in the end of this to hold the tool bit. Then a quick trip over to the mill to do the cross drill there for the actual tool bit that's going to sit in there. For the tool bit, I decided to dig through my box of broken and dull high-speed steel tooling here, and I found this broken center drill that I think is going to make a perfect little tool bit. I chose this approach because I have a D-bit grinder, which is going to be the perfect tool to create this tool bit. If you don't have a D-bit grinder, it's not exactly a common hobby grade tool. Another way to do this would be to use a piece of tool steel and mill the shape that you need and then harden it after the fact. But since I've got the D-bit grinder, I'll start with hardened high speed steel and just grind the profile into it. I start by grinding a decent flat spot on the tool. We don't need a lot of precision here. I have that set at zero. Then I rotate the tool around 120 degrees and I put a second face on it. And those two faces are going to form the cutting edge as well as the bottom clearance for the tool. This will all make sense here at the end. So the second face just gets ground down until that little bit of an edge right there disappears and I get a sharp edge. So some magnification and some light really help when doing this. Next, I turn the tool 180 degrees, so it's upside down now, and I need to create a third face on the end. This has to be done with the tool upside down because this is a compound angle, and the way that the head works on a D-bit grinder, upside down is the only way to do this. So I angle it back 10 degrees, and I swing it around past 90 by 10 degrees to give me the two additional clearance angles that are needed. In this top-down view here, you can see that this angle right here is needed so that as the tool spins, the back of it clears the radius that it's creating. And then there's a vertical angle on the same face that clears the side of the cut as the tool goes down. Those last two clearance angles are thus created with a single compound angle face on the end here. Again, this is all very easy on the D-bit grinder, which is why I did it this way, but again, you can certainly do this on a milling machine on a piece of annealed tool steel as well. Or if you want to use an old tap or an old drill like I'm doing, you can anneal it first, machine it, and then reharden it. Then finally, I just cut the old end of the center drill off since we don't need that, and I give all of those faces a good stoning. Hopefully you can kind of see from this angle how this works. So that's the cutting edge on the bottom. And you can see this clearance here that tips away from the vertical wall of the cut that's being created. And then from the end, this here is roughly the orientation that the cutter will be sitting in. So you can see the clearance on the bottom there. And then the top right there forms the cutting edge. And then there's an angle that goes kind of into the screen on the back to clear the radius. All right, let's get this thing installed and give it a whirl, so to speak. The thing to remember about making a tool bit like this is that the angles on it are less important than the sharpness of it. You need clearance angles and you need a top rake, but none of these angles have to be perfect. If the tool is sharp and isn't rubbing anywhere, it'll cut. Now I should be able to stick the tool in a collet and line it up with the hole and we're ready to go. But of course it couldn't be that easy. Almost got it lined up and then I ran out of clearance on the side of the casting. So even though this tool is pretty thin, it was not quite thin enough. So back over to the lathe that went, and I turned a bunch of material off the body of it there. I left the top alone so it would still fit in the collet, and now I've got clearance. I'll get some oil on there since the end of that tool is kind of running in a bearing there. And spin it up, and well, it looks pretty good. I ran this very slowly at first because the tool pressure here is very high and it's likely to chatter. This is 100 RPM. This seemed to be working pretty well. It's an interrupted cut initially because of the draft angle on the casting there. It's cutting on the high side first. Once I got into a full cut, it started to do pretty well. The main challenge here was tool pressure, of course. It didn't really chatter because I'm running it so slowly and the tool's really well supported in the hole there. The main problem I had was actually getting enough pressure on the tool to cut. What I ended up doing was I'm leaning down on the quill pretty hard in order to get enough pressure downward. Here you can see me doing that on the other side. 
and you see how the quill is bouncing up and down there as the tool goes up on the high side of the casting? Until you get into a full cut, it's quite difficult to get this thing to actually engage. So I had to switch approaches here on the second side. I tried using the fine down feed on the quill, but that feed is a friction clutch and the tool pressure was so high upwards on this tool that it was actually making that clutch slip. So what I ended up doing was locking the quill and pulling down on the column hand wheel, basically feeding down with the head. Even then I had to tighten up the column gib a fair bit to provide some resistance to that upward force on this cutting tool. It's worth noting you could also do this operation from the other side by feeding the tool through and then installing the tool bit. You'd need to run the spindle the other way or have the reverse grind on the tool, but in my case that just didn't have any advantages over doing it straight down from above. Against all odds, once again, the surface finish on those spot faces is actually pretty decent. So I'm pretty pleased with how that all turned out, and that is the last of the features needed on this main casting here. So we've made excellent progress on this die filer, but there's lots, lots more to do. We've got a whole mechanism to build still, so I hope you'll stay tuned for the rest of this project. I want to thank you very much for watching, and thanks to my patrons especially. You know, the patrons have supported this channel throughout the years, and those of you who've joined recently, I really want to thank you, because a regular influx of patrons is really what keeps this channel going. So thank you again, and I will see you next time.